Deep within the eastern fringe of the galaxy lays a constellation of stars once known as the Wings of Sanguinius. However, in recent history, they've become known under the name of the Grendel Stars, the bone-littered nest of an obscure Xeno race that threatens the topple of stability of the entire eastern territory. This race is known as the Bargisi, hyper-violent aliens only kept in check by the watchful eyes of the Space Marines of the Iron Lords chapter. It is currently unknown to the wider Imperium how widespread these beasts are within the Grendel Stars, as little is known about their existence to all but the Iron Lords and the Ordo Xenos. The Bargisi are quarantined to the Grendel Stars by the Iron Lords network of fortresses called Holdfasts, which are stationed at each major star in the system. However, as effective as this barricade is from keeping out Imperial Travelers, the Beastmasters of the Dark Eldar are known to frequently raid the Grendel Stars to take Bargisi back to their gladiatorial fighting pits, using their ability to navigate the webway. However, this sees the Bargisi taken out of reach from real space, which is not exactly detrimental to the Iron Lord's goals. See, the true motivation of the Iron Lords to keep a watchful eye on these Xenos lie not in the hyperviolence, but as an asset to keep away from the true threat the Tyranid menace of Hive Fleet Kraken. Inquisitors of the Ordo Xenos have theorized that if the genetic data of the Bargisi were to fall into the hands of the Tyranid Hive Mind, the raw physical power and hyper-aggression of the Bargisi could be so great a boon to the Tyranid forces that Hive Fleet Kraken could conquer the entire eastern fringe completely unopposed. So is the nature of the iron grip of the Iron Lords to keep the Bargisi in and the Kraken out. And the Dark Elder, uh, <laughs> I don't know. They can play with the toys sometimes, I guess, because they're going to sneak in anyways. But uh, yeah, make sure you put them back or somebody's going to get power fisted. If you've seen my video on the Shattered Legions where I covered the Iron Lords, you may be familiar with the Bargisi. Due to their nature as an obscure Xeno species relegated to essentially being a footnote in a few codices, mainly in the Dark Eldar 5th uh, edition codex and these listed sources here, uh, which are all pretty much relevant to the Iron Lords, uh, there are no pictures or physical descriptions of their species. However, here are some clips from that video of what we extrapolated and established in that video on what a Bargisi uh, singular form Bargest could possibly look like. The name Bargisi sounds like the plural form of Bargest, a creature from northern English folklore. It is described as a ghost or goblin in the shape of a large dog that is an omen of bad luck. The general non-weeb shit consensus of a Bargest seems to be some kind of ugly goblinoid werewolf which may be undead to some degree. Got it. So in essence, we're looking at some kind of deformed alien werewolf goblin thing. But I feel like that'd just be a little uh, boring if we just did that directly. Given that I am one of the few people on Earth to provide this Xeno race with any kind of physical description, I wanted to flesh out my own personal interpretation of a Bargast, uh, starting with one simple clarification. Uh, none of the books that reference the Bargisi clarify their intelligence. It's implied to be bestial, given that they are the frequent target of Dark Eldar Beastmasters, but I thought it would be more interesting if the Bargisi were intelligent, uh, possibly spacefaring. I feel like this change makes the conflict between the Iron Lords, Dark Eldar, and the Bargisi generally a little uh, less one-sided. So instead of them trying to essentially keep rabbit animals in their pens, it's more of a strategic game of chess, with the fate of the Eastern Fringe uh, essentially being the prize. Plus, this also helps the idea that they are spacefaring, uh, making them more of a threat to the whole system, as opposed to essentially being a barking pit bull locked in a car. But don't worry, the AC is on, and its favorite song is playing. Combining this newly self-established intelligence with their frequent attendance in Russell Crowe films, I wanted to make my interpretation of Arbigizi as like an ex-gladiator of sorts, 
that may now be working as some kind of mercenary. Uh, maybe he escaped and returned to Barghese society as a freelancer of sorts. Or maybe he slipped through the iron grip in search of the highest bidder for his services. Actually thinking about it, it would be kind of cool to see this thing like working with a rogue trader or something. Maybe not permanently, but you know. Uh, there are a lot of ways you can spin this aesthetic, uh, and this is generally the angle I like. With all that out on the table, I wasn't actually really sure how to start this build, but uh, while I was on vacation, I found this little gray render miniature from the Dungeons & Dragons miniature sets. Uh, it's not as werewolfy as I had originally envisioned, but the general girth of the model brings this terrifying power of a hippopotamus to mind. So I'll start with this and then add the more houndish, goblin-y elements later. I imagine a Barghese as tall and imposing, and given that this thing sits on a 50mm base, I decided that was a pretty good uh, foundation to build off of. These PVC miniatures are a bit of a pain to clean up compared to plastic or resin, but it's really nothing fancy, it just takes a little longer, and sometimes you have to slice at the mold line as opposed to scrape it but yeah, it's not rocket science. With his current pose, I kind of reimagined him holding a firearm up in like a menacing advance, but I have to adjust the right arm to accommodate that pose. For this, I broke out my hacksaw, but for some reason my pellet brain was just really having issues with this, so I swapped to a smaller hobby saw instead. I, I genuinely don't know <laughs> what was going on in my brain, um, so yeah. After making cuts at the wrist and elbow, I drill small holes to add pins, which will help give the new arm pose of strong inner support. He'll also be needing to uh, actually hold the gun, so uh, after giving each finger a little identifier, I slice them all off. Now we'll move on to the gun. I used the spare heavy bolter from a Chaos Space Marine kit. My plan was to add this curved section from what I assume is a Death Guard gun, I can't really identify, and just kind of generally gussy it up from there, uh, with a rectangular bit of plastic card to serve as the basic handle. Uh, I didn't want anything super fancy, because the fingers are going to be glued around it anyways, so there's not much of a point in adding a lot of detail there. To bend the fingers into their final positions, I cut most of the way through the fingers to leave them slightly connected but able to be bent and posed into a proper gun holding position. With most of the gun assembled and the fingers in place, uh, it was just a matter of gap filling with your choice of epoxy putty at this point, uh, making sure to remember to re-sculpt the lined texture of the skin before it finishes curing. With the gun arm in position, I turn to the torso. With the Gladiator vibe in mind, my mind kept thinking of these straps that are secured to a big thick belt, similar to the Orc Boy overalls. To achieve this, I turned to mixing green stuff and milliput, which some people are calling gorilla put. Using this mixture would enable me to trim and sand the straps more easily after it cured, achieving an overall smoother result. What I did was flip over my cutting mat to the smooth, uh, generally unfucked side, and rolled a long sausage of putty. I laid it down on the mat and began to flatten it out, using hand lotion as my lubricant of choice uh, to ensure it doesn't stick to the mat. Uh, I like using lotion uh, because it helps with my dry skin, and it's way less of a bitch to clean up than vegetable oil. After flattening it out as much as I could by hand, I used a knife to trim the length of the straps. I wasn't too concerned with a perfect result now, just getting as good as I could. When the putty stiffened up a little bit, I laid it onto the model, pressing it on to make sure it adhered. From there I gave it a little bit of time to cook, and when it was partially cured, I used my knife to straighten up the straps. Then when the straps were fully cured, I came back in with a sanding stick to make sure I got that smooth finish. While the straps were curing, I took my little ruler and eyeball measured some ears that I was going to sculpt out of green stuff. 
Um, uh, I'm gonna be honest, I can't even really, like, wrap my head around the shape of an ear. Uh, like, it's a weird combination of spiral and sausage, and I struggled to make a regular ear as practice, much less a goblin-y kind of ear. I'll need to practice on this again, but hey, I made something that could be ear-like at a distance, which, you know, I, uh, I think I could live with that. This set of ears, though, uh, ended up being a little too large, but I wasn't too miffed because I actually ended up sculpting a backup pair of ears, which were about uh, maybe half the length of the first pair, and those are the ones I ended up using, and I'm really glad I uh, decided to sculpt two different sizes. I wanted to armor up our weird little guy here, and the easiest way to do that was with some pauldrons which I felt helped lean the model into the gladiatorial vibe I was leaning into. Did I proofread this shit? I took this spare pauldron from a Storm Fiends kit that I used to make my obliterators a long time ago due to its layered construction. I feel like when it was painted, it would look like a scrap of Dark Eldar armor, either fashioned specifically for their slaves or maybe a salvaged bit of metal from a wrecked vehicle. I think it personally ended up paying off. The only thing I added were these 2 inch jewelry head pins as like uh, rivets or mounting pins or I don't know, deck screws, whatever, just to make it look like it's actually attached to something and not just kind of floating on his arm. At some point while looking at gladiator references I just became entranced by the idea of a chainmail sleeve, sort of similar to the gladiatorial uh, manica that protects a single arm but uh, with less layered plate and more of a vibe I can only describe as like punkish old hammer, I don't know. To do this I layered on a mix of green stuff and milliput, trying to make sure no parts were covered too thinly, as we'll need a little bit of thickness in our uh, putty to make sure we can sculpt properly. So a million years ago I learned how to sculpt chainmail from a tutorial uh, from a fellow YouTuber called Tom Mason. With a pointed tool, uh, I started with a toothpick, but I remembered I had my old chainmail tool. Um, stab into the putty, push it in one direction, then move back and do the same in the rest of the row. Um, I realize that audio description is not going to make a lot of sense, but just look at the screen. Uh, the goal is to get a little C-shaped link down an entire row. Then when you finish that row, you reverse the next one making sure the direction of each one alternates as best as you can. Uh, you're generally aiming for tiny little crescents to mimic the interlocking chain loops of chainmail. While I have seen some more complex chainmail sculpting, uh, the amount of effort that you have to go through is uh, just ridiculous. And this looks fine, honestly. I've been doing it this way for years. Looking at the final product, uh, yeah, I'm gonna have to say the chainmail sleeve was a good idea. Uh, this dude is a total badass. After the chainmail sleeve cured, I turned my attention to the head. I glued some small leftover spheres of putty into the eye divots of the original model to give it some depth later on uh, when I was painting it up. I also trimmed off the brow of the right side of the head for those three eyes and uh, made a little notch that I could slip this little, uh, I guess, I don't know, fucking Super Saiyan heads up display, Warhammer eyeball scope looking ass thing everybody always wears. Um, I actually don't know the proper name for this, but I made mine have three scopes because the Bargeezy, uh have three eyes now. Uh, and I, I don't know. I like it. Just a little something to give it a little more sci-fi Warhammer flair, you know? From there, it was time to move on to the fur of the body, mainly on the back, the chest, and the uh, left uh, back of hand. Is there a proper name for the back of your hand? Anyways, while I initially had the idea to sculpt this big poofy mane for the Bargast, I uh, kind of decided you know, something that hyper violent is probably not going to be very well groomed. So instead of doing a big fluffy mane, I went for a 
more uh, neglected, kind of, kind of greasy looking hair. Like there's so much oil and grease and nastiness built up into his hair that it all kind of forms like these long neglected locks. Even after sculpting it, I don't know. I'm I'm just kind of a big fan of big floofy fur in general. Um, I don't regret the greasy hair look as I'm glad I tried something different. But yeah, maybe a big fluffy mane could give more of like the the wild, untamed kind of look, but I'm happy as is. With the majority of the model done now, I turn my attention to the uh, back to the straps. I realize that at the moment, this is just kind of like one big, solid, I don't know, harness, essentially. Uh, so I take a moment to sculpt on some, uh, like the front of a belt. So it actually looks like a proper uh, belted harness with adjustable straps. Somewhere in the process, I also ended up hanging uh, a dark Eldar and a space marine helmet from his belt, um, mainly as like trophies. Maybe, you know, these are people he killed and he just carries their helmets around. Uh, later on, I actually end up painting the space marine's helmet with a white stripe, uh, which means it's from the first company, uh, the Iron Lord's veteran company. So, yeah, you know, he killed, like, a veteran or something. With all of the sculpting done, it was really just a matter of moving on to painting. Um, nothing super complicated here. I started from a black prime. From there, it was just a matter of dry brushing a dark gray, then a gray, then a light gray. Uh, if you see me paint black, uh, any, or <laughs> uh, any black part in my Space Marine videos, this is going to look really similar. After the metallics and the browns were painted in, I washed the entire model with a mix of Army Painter Black, Army Painter Brown, and some glaze medium. The black fur sections were slightly different. Uh, I replaced the brown with a little bit of a blue wash from Games Workshop. I don't think you can really see the difference, but it's... Like, in person, it's a little more noticeable, but, eh, yeah. Honestly, the whole paint job is pretty standard. The only noteworthy thing was the left pauldron and the Dark Eldar helmet. Um, I wanted to recreate that Incubi, uh, whatever color that's, like, so synonymous with the Dark Eldar, uh, but I didn't feel like buying it. So I ended up doing the paint mixture that's listed on the screen. And I felt like after a little bit of that uh, black wash with that the rest of the body got, I felt like it would be pretty close. And for what it's worth, I think I got pretty close. It doesn't really have the color depth that, you know, the heavy metal paint jobs give it on the web store. But, uh, yeah, I... It's, it's close enough for me. I can look at that and say, you know, that looks pretty dark Eldari to me. <laughs> so, uh, hey, mission accomplished. Whatever. I didn't really spend a lot of time on the base either. It's a fairly standard deserty kind of base. The only real uh, noteworthy thing here that I added was a recasted base element from the Primaris Apothecary, which is like a fallen marine. Uh, I have this blue stuff mold that I made uh, like 20 years ago at this point. Uh, I just shoved some milliput into it, made a perfect copy, threw it on the base, chopped up a little bit, and honestly the rest of the base was just sand, some rocks, and then I painted it up all dusty. It's really, uh, really nothing too complicated and feel like it was worth going into. But, you know, hey, you know, if you guys want me to go into that level of detail in the future let me know but yeah i didn't feel like it was anything uh really worth mentioning so uh yeah fuck it let's get to the final shots so here's my personal interpretation of the bargeezy singular form bargast parentheses probably i don't know it feels to me that just makes sense bargeezy sounds like a plural so bargast you know, would be the singular form. But, uh, yeah, whatever. 
as you can see here, I ended up moving that shoulder pad color uh, that was on the helmet over to the gun as well. I felt like the gun was a little plain and uh, just a little splash of color up there. Kind of helps it pop. Um, the gun also received uh, two more little additions to it from, honestly, I don't even know what those bits are. Um, I found it in my bits box and I cut it in half and I just stuck it to the gun. And I don't know, it feels like it helps generally bulk it up like beforehand that was like a strength 4 gun this is a strength 5 gun now you know I realized that the final product might not look as werewolfy as you know the original description of the bar guest may have uh, implied but I feel like you know it's it's an alien you know and it could be a little different um, plus I don't know I just I really when I saw the original miniature in the store, I was like, I don't know why I need this, but I need this. And now, in hindsight, I realize that this gave the vibe that I wanted for the Bargast. It just, you know, it's got a little different of face. But if you kind of squint, it looked kind of doggy. <laughs> <It's>, right? <laughs> but yeah, man, in general, I just, I really like how this model came out. Like, even physically, in my hand, he's fucking hefty. <laughs> um, and putting him right next to the Iron Lord's Marine, I don't know. That feels like these guys standing next to each other, that looks like a proper rivalry. Like, I don't know. Um, like, if it was a scrawny little werewolf guy, it, it would probably be a little more on point. But having something this huge and physically imposing standing next to an Astartes. It's like, you look at it and you go, oh man, this this thing is like scientifically engineered to fuck my face to death, you know? And like, with a reputation that the Bargeezy have, like that's a vibe, <laughs> uh, I, you know, that's a vibe I want him to have immediately. Um, I want a Marine to turn around and see this and go, oh, fuck. But yeah, this is, uh, this has been fun. Um, going from essentially a couple of throwaway lines in some codices to having a model in my hand. Um, it was a bit different than the Sloth video because the Sloth video kind of had some adjacent creature artwork from, like, Dungeons & Dragons I could kind of reference but here, I mean, I've only ever seen two other references or uh, depictions of a Bargeezy on the wider internet. One of them is like some kind of octopus gorilla looking thing. And the other one is like futuristic great white sharks, um, which are all, they're both, they're both, you know, really cool. Um... So, I'm glad I could throw my own kind of interpretation into the ring. Maybe somebody will like it, or it'll inspire somebody down the line to make somebody or something that's, I don't know, cooler? I don't know. But yeah, I'll stop rambling. Uh, thank you guys for watching this video. I really enjoy the uh, amount of support I get from you guys here on YouTube. Just recently, I've opened a Patreon as well for those interested in helping me financially. Because as we all know, this hobby is certainly... Uh, not cheap. It's a little bare bones right now considering I, you know, just made it, but I plan to do a lot of behind the scenes work in progress stuff over there. I'll host some more important polls over there occasionally. It's also an entry for any kind of giveaway on the channel, and I'll also probably end up posting a bunch of unrelated blog stuff over there. Maybe some stuff about some anime, some video games, like I just finished some anime recently and I've been kind of looking for a reason to talk about it so maybe i'll just throw it over there but don't feel like you have to uh all my content is going to be free patreon is just a option for those who want the behind the scenes stuff or just generally want to support me in some way regardless thank you guys for watching and i'll see you in the next one